what the Lord said of me. And so um, we have this check for $10,000 for the food bank. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. It, it's so it's so fun. It's so fun because it's not our money, you know. Amen. Yeah. So, amen. We love you. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, it, it's so funny. As I was praying, I was praying. Um, I said, Lord, you know, do you want me to buy that building we were in? You know, and um, so I, 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 I want to buy that building over there. It which went down from $7 million to $1.7 million. And so I said, Lord, you know, I'll just, you know, I could pay cash and still buy the jet. You know, I said, so, you know, what do you want me to do? I said, I'll just let them, those, those guys stay in there over there. And we'll just have that building, you know. And so I'm waiting on the Lord for that. But that's what I was praying about. And he says, oh, by the way, could you just write the check to a pastor for $10,000 for his food bank? I appreciate it. And it's like, it's just like nothing to me to do that. But yet, it used to be, if I found a dime, I mean, that, I mean, I remember when I was at Rama, gas went from 99 cents a gallon to a dollar three, and I was in the red for the month. That's how tight it was. I mean, I was working three jobs to stay at Rama. And I didn't eat. I, I, when I was at my job at Southwest Airlines for the first couple years, I actually would buy a, a can of Joe Weider weight gain, the big can. Joe Weider, that's what I would live off of for the month. I couldn't afford to buy food because I had all these college bills and things like that. So I, I think about what the Lord has done in my life with, with finances and knowing like where I end and where he begins. And so I just wanted to tell you that I did that publicly for a reason. I wanted to, I wanted to be able to testify of God's faithfulness in our lives and Kathy and I's lives. We get excited. Um, I mean, if it was 50,000, we'd be on the floor rolling and laughing. It doesn't even matter to us because what it means is, is that God is planning on getting something to us. But he has to get something through us before he can get something to us because it's a flow. Did you hear what I just said? That's a t-shirt. <laughs> anyway, um, the Lord told me not to use notes this morning. So uh, he said he wants me to prophesy for the next hour. Or so, you know, out of my spirit, which is like normal to me. And. What he said was the name of this message, I, and I'm forgetting a whole bunch of things, I'm sure, but the, the name of this message is called Putting Your Foot Down in Prayer, and um, it would be subtitled Bulldog Faith, and um, I've had ankle biters, I call them, they're little, little dogs that just clamp onto you, and they think they're really effective, you know, but they... They, they weigh less than five pounds, but they'll, they'll clamp onto you and you drag them around. And after a while, it's, it's amazing that a five pound dog actually is effective after a while because it gets irritating that you're dragging this thing around and you're like looking and it is fierce and it, they, they show their teeth and they think that they're going to take you. But after a while, it's a little irritating and all, all of a sudden I realized that 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 dog's tenacity is effective. After a while, you almost admire that dog for being tenacious, you know? And, it, and um, I want to talk about that kind of faith this morning in prayer, about being persistent in prayer and knowing that the Spirit of God, like, like so many times, has taken me to the future and I've stood there knowing what was going to happen. And then I, I come back and I just play it out. I already know it's going to happen. And so one of the things that Jesus said that I wanted to, I wanted to say, he, he spoke to me this morning about this message. And then he, he showed me this verse. So I found it. And it, it's when Jesus was, was uh, coming to the tomb of Lazarus. And... If you read, it's amazing. This is in John 11. 
it's amazing what Jesus went through before he performed the miracle. And, and um, I, he's shown me this because, you know, there's a lot of disappointing things that happen when God is moving. It doesn't even sound right, does it? But a lot of dif disappointing things will happen. Jesus went through this too. What you have to do is you have to look at the beginning of the, of the chapter and read things in context and read around the scripture. And what you find is, is that everything was trying to stop Jesus from getting to Lazarus. But see, he actually put the brakes on and he waited till the fourth day, which I, I know I was told this, that uh, a lot of the Jewish people say that they, there was this belief that the spirit of a person stayed for three days around the body and that on the fourth day, that was the end of it. So Jesus actually just like demolished that by waiting till the fourth day. And that's what I was told, you know, and I'm, I'm not a scholar, um, you know, I don't think I am. I, I just telling you that I do a lot of study and a lot of people say that. And I have a, had a Jewish teacher that taught me Hebrew. So he would tell me all these things. And th the stuff he would tell me was just a, was just blew me away. I mean, he's passed away. His name is Ori. And um, he grew up in Jerusalem, you know, on the streets of Jerusalem playing, he said. And uh, he would teach me these nuances. But see... He explained, he says, I, he says, I believe that Jesus was the Messiah for the Gentiles. He said, I'm not quite there yet for, for me. But he said, you're starting to convince me. And over the years, you know, I was able to share with him. But he said, he said Jesus, what, what Jesus was doing was this. So he would give me these insights. So in prayer, Jesus intentionally delayed things. And so I want to talk to you about what it means to be have a divine delay. And um, it sets you up. It sets you up so that there's a countdown and there's an anticipation and people start to latch on to the anticipation of something. And this is what happens in prayer. See, to me, prayer is fun and an experience. The reason why is, is what Jesus said here. He stood up in front of the tomb and he said, Father, thanks for hearing me. I know you always hear me. Bam. Relationship. Thanks for hearing me. You always hear me. He said, but I said it out loud for the benefit of everyone listening. And then I started to realize everything that I go through is really a prayer conquest. It's a journey. It's an experience as part of my relationship and your relationship with God. It's not to beat you up and get you distraught and worried and, and uh, you know, you get into this battle. Like, I got to keep my faith. You know, faith has never been mental. And Jesus gave us this secret. And all of you all over the world, listen to me. Jesus said that when you believe in your heart, not in your head, when you believe in your heart and you say with your mouth, you believe in your heart and you say with your mouth, mountain be removed, be cast into the sea. If you believe in your heart that what you say with your mouth will be done, it shall be done. So... I want to tell you something. You can doubt in your head and believe in your heart. But you can't believe in your head and have something move. It's, that is mental exercise, and it borders on witchcraft. Now, th this is what I mean. You can get around someone that's deceived, and it won't be long before you are. And you don't want to be deceived, but if you don't make a judgment as a spiritual person that that's deception, that's wrong, then what happens is, is that, that, that solical power, that realm will pull you in. That's why Timothy, that's why Timothy was told by Paul, listen, if, you, if someone has a form of godliness but denies the power, the power of the resurrection, have nothing to do with them. Don't, don't, don't have anything to do with them. Why? That's what I'm talking about. There's a soul power, which is really witchcraft. 
okay, so I can actually manipulate people. And with my soul, now I, this happens to me all the time. All the time. I get around people and I feel like I'm being pulled a certain way. But if I'm not careful and make a discernment about it, I discern this is soul power. And so I'm not supposed to do this for this person because that's the soul. Their soul is very powerful. So, like, that's why I have to say, listen, you know, we're booked up forever. I can't come. I mean, we're booked up forever, but if you want to talk to someone about it, you talk to Ryan. You don't talk to me about it. Because what happens is they sit down with me. Before you know it, I'm going to clear my whole year for them. <laughs> because of my soul. Because I'll do anything for anybody. That's why I have to stay alone a lot. Because I can't, I can't, um, I have to live a lot longer. But people will just draw off of you. Okay, so Jesus was being pulled in his soul by Mary and Martha. Oh, Lord, if you would have been earlier, you know, this wouldn't have happened. Scold him. And you can read all this stuff in this chapter. And Jesus had to go through this. I'm sure he's doing eye rolls, you know. Okay, so here's why you have to put your foot down in prayer. You have to right away, if you talk to a general, if you talk to the special forces guys, and I had those kind of friends. I had friends that were in the intelligence field. They defined their borders before they went to war. They never went to war unless they defined their mission. Now, what happens is, is the objectives are listed there, and once you rehearse those, and so on the, on the jet over there, they would all sit around or in the C-130 before they were thrown out over a country. They went over their objectives, and they didn't stray from that no matter what. So even if their extraction point was compromised, they had the secondary. And if they got separated, then they knew, to, they knew to, what to, when they split up that one would go by by water, one would go by land, one would go by air. They would split up so that they'd be, they, they, they couldn't all, the whole team couldn't be taken out. But there was all of these scenarios that if this happened, we're gonna do this. They already had figured out every chess move on the board. And if they knew that if something went wrong, they knew, everyone knew what they were all gonna do and that how they would meet up again. And the objective, the objectives were done no matter what. And it, it, was, it was made to be predictable. And so Jesus, if you look, so like right now, if someone needed to be raised from the dead, I would ask maybe half of you to leave. Now, that is, that is not a mean thing to do. It is the necessary thing to do because if I was one of those persons that can't even kick into neutral, then I, if I'm like doubting or fearing, then I need to separate myself from that so that I don't destroy the faith in that room. So that's why Jesus did that. He chased out people. He, sometimes because he was working with Peter, James, and John, he would use them. And they could go with them. But then there were times where he chased everybody out because they were not on the same page as him. Because he puts his foot down. The reason why he could raise Lazarus from the death, dead was because he was the resurrection. Yeah. And he says that right there. I am the resurrection and the life. But if you realize who you are, and that you are going to die someday, but you really don't die. And you're going to always live and, and exist. And that the knowledge you have down here, you're going to build upon forever. That you don't get to heaven and know everything. And there are people that actually are escorted right to class, and they go to class. There will be people watching my classes. Jesse DePlanis saw that my school will be played up there. 
and people will be sitting watching my courses for eternity. Now, not, not just mine, but you understand that we will always be learning, and you can't know everything ever because we're not God. Even in heaven, we, we, will, we won't know everything. And so you, if you realize that you're going to live forever and that it's only going to get better, then you don't want to waste any time with foolish things. You don't want to waste your time. And you don't take no for an answer. Now, the only magical thing that happens to you when you die is you lose your body, which is an anchor, a boat anchor. And you lose part of your mind that you didn't lose down here. Because you need to lose your mind. You need to be out of your mind down here. Okay? You need to be crazy. Please don't write me. They, uh, people get mad when I say crazy, but they don't understand. Those four crazy friends that, that, that lowered their friend through the roof yeah. got that person healed. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about faith. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you are not, the only transition that happens is, is that you lose your boat anchor. And you lose any soulish part of you that did not survive the fire. So if you submit yourself now to the cleansing fire, then you, when I, when I was, when I passed away and I was with Jesus, I still had emotions and my mind, but it was cleansed. It was, it was saved. I could not doubt. I could not fear at all. It's just like right now, my, like my angel just came and he's behind me. I cannot doubt, I cannot fear. I could care less what you think of me right now. I can't, I, because I'm already in the eternal realm now because of this angel. But he could leave right now and go eat or something, I don't know, and it, I won't feel that anymore. But what the Lord says, what my goal is for you, Kevin, is that is you walk this way all the time, whether there's an angel or not, whether people are throwing eggs at you or rocks, can you still walk and can you still preach the same message? So what he says, I'm going to train you. He says, you're going to Puerto Rico and you're going to teach them how to poke the eye out of a hurricane. I go, you got to be kidding me. They have one every couple months. He says, not anymore. You're going to teach. So he sends me to the poorest town, and he, we had like 32 people. That was the biggest. And, of course, it takes twice as long because you have to have an interpreter, so it, it like, takes forever. You know, my two-hour services turn into four, you know, right, right away. I taught them to take their authority, put their foot down in prayer and say, no, you're going to go somewhere else. Go to the Bermuda Triangle. Things disappear there, you know. <laughs> Set of airplanes, let's just send the hurricanes there. Okay, so I taught them their authority. I go, whew. Okay, I did what you said, Lord. He said, this gospel must be preached to the world. It must, whatever you preach must work everywhere. But he, does, he sends you to Hurricane Alley. See, it's fine to teach, to, to teach about hurricanes in Phoenix because it rains twice a year there. Like, like what Pastor prayed, you know, just let it be a sprinkle, not a downpour. I've never heard that in a Phoenix church. <laughs> Even the serpents and scorpions and the tarantulas that are there, they're like begging for water. Like, I'll leave you alone. Just send, give me some water, you know? Okay, so the next year, the Lord says, you're going back to Ponce, you know? One of the poorest towns in Puerto Rico, and you're going to, you're going to have a prosperity seminar. I go, oh, boy. See, this is hard. He goes, Kevin, if it's the gospel, it'll work anywhere. So I had a prosperity seminar <laughs> Supernatural finance seminar there for the weekend. And I taught it as though I was in Scottsdale, where I live. Scottsdale, Arizona, one of the richest places to live. 
at the time. The gospel message has to be preached in all the world, but it has to work everywhere. Okay, so with prayer, when you put your foot down in prayer, the reason you do that is because you know that the Lord hears you. He always hears you because you're his child. It has nothing to do with what happens in the election. It doesn't affect your relationship at all. People just fall upstairs, but it doesn't affect you. Like I said, it just adds a couple more rings to the circus. If you can take it as entertainment, then you can watch it. If not, you don't watch it. If you can't laugh, find something else to watch. Okay, so when you put your foot down in prayer, it's because you know that what you're about to ask is going to be heard. Okay, number one. Now, this is the next step, the big one. The big one, even though it's just one more step. you got to know that he's going to answer you. Okay? It's, now listen, it, the same difference between these two steps is that is the same difference between, okay, I need somebody raised from the dead and I need somebody devil cast out of them. Got anybody that wants to do resurrection? Like, no, I'll take the devil. Well, why? Well, that's easier. Oh, is it? Maybe you haven't met the devils I've met. <laughs> Everything's a miracle. What if you got to the place where you know that the Father is waiting for you to ask and He has already determined that He's going to give it to you? I want to ask you this. Would you pray if you knew that God wasn't listening? Well, that'd be a waste of time. Would you pray if He was listening but you knew He wasn't going to give it to you? Would you pray? No. But he asks us to pray, and we should always pray. We should always ask. So, Jesus said something that is so profound, and no one wants to touch it. He said, ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find, and knock, and the door shall be open to you. No other explanation No other comment, just goes on to another subject. Until you look up the word, and the word is demand, and it shall be given to you. The word there is demand, not ask. Well, that causes even more problems. Why would I demand something from God? Only if he already has given it to you. And the devil's holding on to it. Did you hear what I just said? When you put your foot down and you ask, demanding that what God has already given you come to you, then what you're dealing with is someone who's holding on to it and will not let it go, but it's yours. Does everybody follow me? Or do I need to return back to the beginning and give another $10,000? Do I need to start all over again? Huh? Somebody wants to make money today. Yeah, let's just make it Groundhog Day. <laughs> I got you, babe. It's 6 a.m., you know? Remember that movie? All right. So... When you put your foot down, the reason you put your foot down is because you've had it. And the reason you had it is because you know that your father is a good God, a good father, who desires to give you the kingdom, has already laid out the mission and the objectives of the mission, the boundaries before the war have already been drawn. He's already explained to you that the thief, he labels the thief, the enemy, as killing, stealing, and destroying. 
And he said, but I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. So he goes beyond, just like the conqueror and the more than the conqueror. He says, not only life, but abundant life. Well, I don't need abundant life in heaven because that's God's kingdom up there. And there is no lack. There is no sickness. There is no destruction. There's no devils. They don't come. They wouldn't dare go there. But down here, I need life and life more abundantly. Down here, I have to deal with the enemy who is killing, stealing, and destroying. So if I see killing, stealing, and destroying, I automatically label that as the enemy. But if I see life and life more abundantly, I know the Lord is working. Okay, so I know that Jesus never made anybody sick. Because if he did, that would determine that the will of the Father was for them to be sick. And so Jesus didn't go around reversing what the Father was doing. If he was making people sick, then why was Jesus going around healing them? He wouldn't work against his Father, right? If somebody had died before their time, why would Jesus go and resurrect them? And unless the whole thing was a scam, that he, they weren't supposed to die. Okay, so he was reversing the enemy's intent, right? He went around doing good and healing everyone that was oppressed of the devil. So it labels what was really going on. So Jesus didn't work against the Father. He was only doing what his father was telling him to do. So Jesus was good. The father is good. So everything he did was good. Okay, that's the goodness of God. But see, you get into this idea about the goodness of God. It's actually substance. It's called glory. And it's abundance. It's abundance. See, there's gold in the glory. So you can get healed as the glory comes into the room. I've seen it happen where everybody, in Switzerland it happened. It came from the back. It was in Geneva. And I remember, I'm standing up here and I'm looking, and I kid you not, it was in the foreign territory. There were, there, the angels would come in, and they would go and stand beside someone. My angel that's here now, it took him four days to get into Germany. I got cleared right away because I had global access from, my, from, my, from flying with Southwest Airlines. I had a, a high clearance F with the FBI, so I, was, I got global access. So I got through, but the angel, my angel didn't show up for four days. I had already done four days of meetings. Why? Because I crossed over into another territory and that angel was fighting. But I want to tell you, we have it on film. My wife was on the front row, watched it happen. Fourth day, we had people lined up here. And I'm praying for people, and I got to right here. And there's still all these people. The power of God, the anointing, is laying them out. I'm not pushing them. I didn't even take my jacket off and wave it on them or anything. Pow. But right here, you can see it as a flash of light that comes right past me, knocks the interpreter over, knocks the rest of the line over, and then the angel stands at the end. And I go, and I, on the film I say, it's about time you got here. <laughs> I mean, there's a streak of light, and it knocks the rest of the line over. Now, I operated in what I operate in, just like you operate in your gifting. So this represented me working with God, operating in what I operate in. But from here on out was another way. But if this doesn't happen, then I have to keep going with the line and praying for people using faith and the gifting that's in me. Do you understand what I'm saying? But then... All of a sudden, the intervention comes, and it's unexplainable. But it's all God. 
unexplainable ministry. Unexplainable. But God finishes it up, and he does what he wants. Okay, so with you, when you put your foot down, the reason you're putting your foot down in prayer is because you know that you're going to be heard, and you know that he wants to answer you, and you know, according to the word of God, that you will receive. And it doesn't matter how long it takes. Because the realms are not congruent. In 1983, when I went to the optometrist to get glasses, I went the whole way there saying, I'm healed. On the way home, I was crying with my glasses in my hand and my contacts in my eyes, crying. This is not God's will. But I needed it because I couldn't see the instructor. And when I got my pilot's licenses, I needed to be able to see. Hello? But I was always healed in my heart, in my spirit. I kept calling the things that are not as though they were. So when I was healed, and now I'm healed, I can see all of you. I don't have contacts in. It's no different than when I was crying on the way home. I believed I was healed in 1983, but it didn't happen until, what, three years ago? Three years ago. Yeah. So, it's the same with our house. We bought our house. It took everything. It, it took an act of God just to get the financing to buy our house. Everybody was so mean. We're a new married couple. We just want a house. How can it be that hard? I didn't really realize at the time that it was a territorial dispute with that spirit that's in Scottsdale, Arizona. We went through that property in that desert, chased away wild animals while we were praying just to figure out what plot was God's plot for us. We, we, even when we moved in, my brother walked out one night, he was staying with us in the brand new house, and cattle were coming down the street. Coyotes, wild pigs, tarantulas. My brother, he stepped out onto the brand new porch and a tarantula was sitting there. He's got scorpions everywhere. There was a dispute. Me, my wife's watched it happen. We're praying in that house and I'm praying in tongues. Me and my wife wore out carpets everywhere we lived. From, we paced for 10, 15 hours a day, praying in the spirit and working full time sometimes. On our days off, I mean, at work, I, I prayed four hours a night in my hotel. That's after doing a 13 hour day. So I know you can do this. But she's watched the largest, it looked like a baby lobster was so big. Watch scorpions come right out as I'm praying in tongues, come out and challenge me to where I'm like, you got to be kidding me. As I'm praying in tongues, they come, they come right at me to try to sting me. I've had them run, walk at night, come right up and sting me right here in the heart, which would have killed me, but I didn't die. Stung me twice. Didn't die. Got up and went to training that day. This one, I go, okay, you want a piece of me? I went and got lighter fluid and lit him on fire and sat there and laughed at him. I did. Crackling. Yeah, come on. Because you can't make this stuff up. It was an example of what happens to you when you start to pray. It was a physical manifestation of what really happens. So when God places you somewhere, there's a reason for it while you're here. What, you're here right here this morning? You're all supposed to put your foot down and command these walls to expand. I don't care if you have to move. 
I don't care if this becomes the office for the pantry and you get a big church. It doesn't matter. You've got to command these walls to expand. And what happens is the next time I come, you'll be four times as large. Not because of me, but because you put your foot down and commanded these walls to be expanded. This is the way it is. It has nothing to do with feelings. It has nothing to do with what you had to eat before or after. If you're on keto, diet, or Fatkin's diet. The, the ca captain one day, we were, we, were, we were at the airport where they have a blue burrito. It's, you get a one-pound burrito. Blue burrito. It's in Phoenix. He goes, hey, you want one? I go, yeah, I, I'll just take a half one. He goes, I'm getting a full one. And this guy's 320 pounds. Captain. So he comes back with his one-pounder. I come back with a half-pound. He gives it to me. He goes, I'll take a Diet Coke. I go, why bother? He goes, well, I'm on this Fatkins diet. It's really working for me. That's where I got that. He's already in heaven. So so when I put my foot down in prayer, it's because I know that God is going to hear me and that he's going to answer me. But I also know that, okay, so I'm praying, I'm praying about a certain situation that, you know, I, I want to build, buy the building that we're in, but the lawyer is going to give it to us, but she's going to retire, and so she doesn't want to move again, so she said, can I just stay there? I go, well, just sell me the building, and I'll give you free rent. She goes, no, I'll just wait. So, I, like, I need that building. I need the whole thing. We're, we're expanding. We already got places in other states. We're expanding. Okay, but the the other thing was, is that I was being told by the Lord, this is what's going on, and you can do what you want about it with this other thing. And I said, well, Lord, okay, well, just confirm it to me. So I go to church, and Jesse DePlanis is preaching, and I'm on the front row, sitting there with Kathy and, and, and his wife, Kathy, and he, he says... The Lord says, you decide what type of this you want and when you want to buy it, and I'll back you. You can do it now or you can wait for two years, but I'll back you on your decision. So he confirms exactly what the Lord had just said to me. What freedom and privilege that God would say, you decide, and I'll back you. Yeah. What a privilege to be considered trustworthy enough to make the right decision. And so, for the last two weeks, you know what I've done? Nothing. You want to know why? I'm waiting until the fourth day. I'm going to make it impossible. Because I know I can fail. I know I can fail. I'm going to finish my race. I've been in eternity, and we win. I know that. You have nothing to worry about. You live your life down here as though you live forever. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Which means that you have all things in Christ. Amen. Which means that he's working with you. He's, he's wanting to win you over to where you're fully convinced of his goodness. And then these little things like a hair dryer that you need, they just come. I can't decide if I want a sunbeam or one of those really fancy ones from Rodeo Drive. Does it really matter to God? No. Just get a hair dryer. I don't have the money for it. Okay, well then see, what you need to do is keep your focus on Jesus and command it to come. Don't focus on the thing. 
And this happened to us, let's see now, three years ago in February, I woke up from a dream. Now, when we travel with Jesse on his jet, we have our seats. And so they take their seats, we have our seats. And it's just the way it is every time. And in the dream, it was reversed. It was a brand new jet that I've never seen before. And I saw the leather on the seats. Now, I'm not praying about a jet. Now, I could care less. I'll, I'll, I'll ride a bicycle if that's what the Lord tells me to do. I don't really care. But I don't care what people think either, whether my bike costs 100 bucks or 1000 It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to obey Jesus, and I'm going to finish my race. You will not be there when I get my reward. You will not, you will not be there for my audit. If it's going to be me and the Lord, you, no one's going to be there. It's going to be me and the Lord. So I got to keep it right with him. Now, what I'm concerned about is I don't see him while I'm preaching flipping my book table over because then I know I'm in trouble. See, I have to stay right in everything I do. I don't write books to make money. I write books to help people. As long as I keep doing that, he'll keep giving me books. But the minute that I say, hey, I can boost my income, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to go in. It's going to be a big smoking hole. You're going to know what happened. So I don't want to see Jesus out there flipping my tables. Okay? So I don't ask amiss. I ask according to the Spirit. But God sometimes wants to pick a fight with the enemy. So he'll give you a dream. And this is what he gave me. And I go, you're just picking a fight. That's what I said to him. You're picking a fight. He says, go find that jet. I go, well, I've never seen, they looked like racing car seats. I, I just saw the interior. But I can tell by the cabin, because I, I've flown jets, I know exactly, like, okay, the size of the, I can get, pretty much know what class it's in. And this is what happened. I went upstairs to my office. And as I went upstairs, in, in the cabin, it was a brand new plane, so it was leather. It was so strong. It came, I kid you not, it came with me out of the dream and into our house. Our whole house filled up with brand new leather smell. It went the whole way up with me, and I sat in my chair, and I said, you're just picking a fight. You realize what's going to happen if I get a jet. But to me, it's... To me, I'm a pilot anyway, and I can fly the jet upside down and eat a sandwich. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, it's no big deal to me. And to me, a businessman can fly in his jet somewhere, no problem. A Christian businessman can fly somewhere in his jet. Little bit of a problem, but not much. But a minister... Flying his own jet. Okay, so I said, well, then I'll just, I'll just pay for it myself. And the Lord said to me, no, I thought I was going to pay for it. So I could just buy it myself. But then I would, cease, I would just say, you know what? I'm no longer a minister. I'm a Christian. And I just go around telling people about Jesus. And the Lord's like, no. No, you're not going to do that. And you're not going to pay for it either. I go, you're just picking a fight. The next thing you know, after that dream, Jesse DePlanis is in the news. He's got four jets, which he doesn't have. He has one. And that whole thing happened. I couldn't believe it. So it, that year in May, we're in Switzerland. And this Swiss banker, who is in every one of my meetings when I'm in Europe, I recognize him every time. Doesn't say anything, just he's there. He calls the church and he says, hey, I see Kevin's going to be in town. Can I invite him to my home for lunch? And so the guy calls me, the pastor, and, and says, no, you know, I don't do that. Well, you know, he's... 
you know, he's a, he's a, he's a banker. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I've had people offer, offer me $750,000 if I become their friend and mentor them. And I said, well, you can do, I'll, you can do that for free. Just come to my conferences. He goes, no, I want your, your, your number and your address, and then I'm going to give you that money. I go, you know what? Keep your money because you're not getting my phone number or my address. This has happened at least two or three times. I've been offered, one time I was offered a lot, a lot more. And um, I don't say anything even to my staff about this because it's ridiculous what we go through. Do you realize how many millions I'd be worth or our ministry be worth if everybody kept their promise? I mean, I'm talking millions and millions of dollars. Okay, so I, I don't, I'm not moved by that. So the Lord says you can go. He says, the Lord tell me, just, just you, Pastor, go with me because I'm not going to be in another country with someone I don't know. So we go an hour into the Alps, and this beautiful home is right there in the middle of this mountain, and you have to take an elevator to get to his kitchen and his dining room. And we're sitting there looking over this. It looks like you're just waiting for the, the Swiss Miss girl to come with her hot chocolate and, <laughs> and the Ricola. The Ricola my, I'm serious. It's just like that. And these people are so wonderful. They're, they're, they're beautiful people. Spirit-filled, love God, and givers, they just love God. And he goes, welcome to Stans. I go, where the Pilatus factory is? The PC-24 is built? He goes, yeah, it's right down there. My son works there. You want to go? Within 45 minutes, I am sitting in the jet that was in my dream. I mean, the exact jet. There's only four of them built at the time. That's why I couldn't find them. The seats, are you ready for this? The ones that look like car, race car seats? BMW does the seats for that jet. That's why they looked like that. So if you've seen that picture of me and my wife on, the, on Facebook, that's the jet. I found myself in that jet within four months after that dream. And listen to this. You know what the banker said? He said, we need, you need this jet. You're exhausted. You need this jet. He said, let's put the $500,000 down right now because it's a two-year wait. I said, we're not doing nothing. He goes, what? I go, I ain't doing nothing about this. This is not my idea. God started this. He will finish it. Amen. I don't know if you understand what it what, <laughs> But see, I've walked away from so many things knowing that it's coming back and tackle me. Do you get this? Do you feel the spirit of faith? It's coming back. If you will walk away, it's coming back. It always comes back. Okay, so when I got saved, the Lord said, you're not going to the academy. I go, I just spent the last three years. I'm in my first year of college and high school to get ready just to qualify. I've been to the senator's offices and the representative's office trying to get them to choose me because they can only choose one from their, you know, from the state. There's two senators, so there's only two people. And then with the representatives, I think in Pennsylvania, there was five. So Senator Hines considered me at the time. You eat his ketchup. But he was, he got killed in a, in a, a couple of years later in a helicopter crash. But I talked to all these people, finally got them, one of them, to consider. Because they, they always choose their son or their, their neighbor's son, you know. <laughs> it's all political <laughs> to get a, an academy slot. The Lord wakes me up and says, you're not going to the academy. I've called you. You're going to the Assemblies of God College. I go, that's not free. The academy is free. You know what happened? I went to my mailbox after he said that. I went to the mailbox, and this, the, the letter from the senator is in there. He goes, um, Kevin, he said, you are runner-up out of 3,300 people. He said, you'll get it next year. You're runner-up.
Well, next year never happened. I went to that Bible college. But did you know that when I got to Southwest Airlines, there were captains at Southwest Airlines. There were three different captains that were the head of the National Guard for their state. Three different ones of three different states. They all said, Kevin, do you want to fly F-16s? I go, Are you kidding me? He goes, uh, I, need, I need pilots. It's a year and a half that you'd have to leave here. But I, I, he said, I'm the commander of the squadron. And we need pilots like right now. So I said, well, yeah, put me in then. He goes, okay, report here for your physical and um, tell Southwest. And they'll give, you, they'll give you actually a leave. And then you can come back, and then you can come back as a pilot for Southwest. And um, I, I was all excited. It was just like when I was at Rama, and I was going to stay and, and travel with Brother Hagen, because I, I was asked to, to be part of the, the singers. And so I was so excited about that, and on the way to, to do the tryout, even though it was, a, it, was a, it was cosmetic, I went to do the tryout for that, and the Lord said, "What are you doing?" What are you doing? I said, I'm going to be a Rama singer. He goes, no, you're not. You're going to Southwest Airlines. I go, excuse me? And I was at Southwest Airlines within a few months. So on the, uh, the same thing has happened to me over and over again. What are you doing? Oh, I'm going to be an F-16 pilot. No, you're not. You're going to be a flight attendant. I go, a flight attendant? <laughs> so for 29 years, I passed up three different slots besides the academy for F-16. Then a pilot came and said, Do you, I'm going to give you all the pilot's licenses. You, you, the Lord told me you're supposed to, to be a pilot, so I'm going to give you everything. So he trained me and paid for the $250,000 and trained me. I got all my licenses. And the Lord said, you're going to stay as a flight attendant. So when the company asked me to be a pilot, the Lord said, no, you're going to be a flight attendant. Okay, so do you understand then if God gives me a dream and says, you're going to have this jet, Do you know that most people wouldn't understand the last 30 years? Do you get it? Just like they, people don't understand you and your faith. Because they don't understand what's behind it. So you sow in your obedience. It's not always money. Sometimes you walking away is sowing. Not allowing yourself to get the glory by delivering yourself or making it better. What if the reason you're here, what if the reason you're hearing this is to know that God has kept track of everything that you have walked away from in obedience because he had something better? Doesn't it say that in the book of Hebrews chapter 11? Some people would not be delivered. They refused because they wanted a better resurrection. They refused to be released. That goes over well. You won't hear that much this morning in most churches. Why? Because they saw him who was invisible. And they knew that there was a great crown for a martyr. And they did not want to be released. You're going to see people with martyr's crowns on them, and they're like, wow. But were you willing to pay that price? Are, do you, are you fully convinced in Jesus to where you would die for him and refuse to be released? No, no, go ahead. Like Peter said, just hang me upside down. I don't want to be upright like my Lord. I want, I don't, I'm not worthy to be upright on the cross. Hang me upside down. That is faith. But see, that's not faith that's a victim. That's faith that knows that there's a crown for those who are martyrs. 
But that what doesn't preach well. That doesn't get good offerings. That doesn't like make people feel like they want to skip out of church. But see, the reason why is you haven't put your foot down. You will not be denied. See, faith is a substance. Jesus yanked Lazarus back into this realm. He went, grabbed him, and brought him back. He yanked him back into his body. He groaned. The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He wept because he knew he was going there himself. He knew where he was going. He wept for humanity. He wept. He was interceding for us. Everybody said, oh, see how he loved him? He's weeping. No, he was weeping for them. Because it took compassion to raise the dead. It took compassion to heal. It takes compassion because you've got to hate sin and the results of sin. Jesus wept because he hated sin and the results of sin. And that compassion caused him to yank somebody back from the dead. It's, faith is more than what you think. So all of you, I'm being a little harder on you all. It's different when you got 1,800 people that could charge you, you know, but you, you all, we look a little safer, you know. But I'm being hard with you because one day you will re be reminded of this morning. I've already been there. It has changed my life forever what I encounter with Jesus. And what I have brought back with me is this, is there's though, there are those of us who will adhere to the mission's objectives and those who will not. There will be a division between those who did and those who did not. And you're going to remember that you had an opportunity to step forward and say, you know what, no matter what, I am not going to be denied. No matter what, I am going to stay in there I will stay single until God brings the right person to me. I don't care if I have to be called Mother Teresa and everybody else. I am going to stay right with what God has for me. I'm not going to compromise. When I got to the place where I was willing to stay single, I was married very quickly. But I had to die to it and mean it. At that point, I received what was always mine. Now, I'm going to say something that's going, to, that's going to blow you away, but you're probably blown away anyway. When I was with Jesus, there was a stack of this size letters, a stack four inches tall, sheets of paper. It looked like prayer requests. I said, what is that? He said, that's everything you're ever going to ask me. It's already signed. I go, wait a minute. I haven't, I haven't even prayed these yet. He said, that, yes, and I've already signed them. They're yours. It's sitting right there on his desk. So I'm sent back with this, this kind of thing inside of me. And I have to determine how, at what point do I release and, and let people know that they're going to find out who they really were, and they're going to see that they were like him, the one who sits on the throne. And you're all going to realize I should have prayed more. I should have believed for more. I should have not given in. I should have not compromised. Why did I ever doubt? Because I saw that eternity was, Jesus showed me that little hash mark in the timeline, like I talk about. It was represented man's existence on the earth compared to eternity. It was a little hair's breadth. My existence, our existence, of less than 10,000 years is, is a little, it was a knife mark in the timeline and compared to eternity. When I was with Jesus, it was as though 
the earth in my whole life, it was weird. It was like trying to remember an episode of Gilligan's Island. It was like make-believe. It wasn't even real. I'm serious. Like everything you're facing right now, it's so weird. When you get to heaven, you can't even put your finger on it or think back. You can't, it, it's foreign. There's no attachment to it. Like right now, I hear saints screaming and yelling, preach, preach it. Like right now, I can hear it. You hear the rain. I hear saints who have gone on before me, and they're saying, tell them he's worthy. Tell, preach the news. Preach that good news. We did it. You can do it. I hear that all the time. People, people that, that have passed on, that were my friends, I've seen them in full sight on a balcony yelling over the balcony at me and they had just passed within 24 hours. It happens every single time. They yell from that balcony. One lady that was my best friend introduced me to Kathy. And then she got sick and she passed. Within, within that, that day, I saw her on the balcony, and she yelled down to me. She said, Kevin, Kevin. And I'm like, I'm like, looking, and Kathy's not, you know, not saying anything. We're married. She's not, I go, and Kathy wasn't saying Kevin, but there's nobody else there. So I look up, Kevin, up here. And I'm like, you can't make this up. I go, Dottie. She goes, Kevin, i just been to see Jesus. And we talked, and we talked about you. And she says, I just want you to know, I told him everything about what you, all your desires to make an album, and all the desires about the ministry, and all the money that you're going to need, because she, she was a millionaire. But she never got to do all the things that she was going to do. She said, I just want you to know, Jesus told me he's going to get everything. And so he let, me, he let me tell you. He says, just so you know, you're going to get everything. This is back in 1993, right? 94. Well, look now. This just happened last week with Ryan's mom. She just passed away. Happened with my dad. I'm not communicating with the dead. I'm communi communicating with the living. They didn't come back and appear to me. They were just hanging over the balcony. I don't think you can crucify me for that. It's a balcony. If Jesus would walk in right now, of course, I would hit the deck. I'd hand him the mic. And um, this is what he would say. He would say the same things I'm saying. Don't ever give up. Don't ever back off. I don't see these four walls. I see them, but they're about, about another 200 feet in every direction. Every time I see a need, I go, what do you want me to do about that? I automatically ask the Lord, what do you want me and Kathy to do about that? As soon as I see a need, every single time. If I see somebody wear the same thing twice... I want to buy them a wardrobe. Why? Because I have in me my father who wants to do that. I want to make it better for everybody. But how do I do that? I'm obedient. I don't give an inch. Now, I want you to know that if I never get a jet, it didn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If this is the last meeting I ever preach, it wouldn't even matter to me. If that's what God wants. I will walk away and disappear, and I will give you my address on Maui. <laughs> Ka'anapali.
and I will on purpose post every day from the beach. I will walk away. I'll walk away. Can you walk away from what you want, knowing that God has a huge plan? Can you do, that's faith. Can, can you die so you could live? Do, can you experience a crucified life so you can experience resurrection power? I know, I, listen, I read Paul a lot. When I'm around people with gray hair, Kenneth Hagin told me, if you're around somebody with gray hair, do not talk. Listen, because they know more than you. So I listen a lot. Jesse has gray hair, and he talks a lot. But when he stops, I ask him another question. He goes, well, don't you want to talk? I go, nope, I know everything I know. But you, you're, you're a general. I need to know what you know. Because what I don't know is going to hurt me. It's going to come back and bite me. The Lord had told me three, three years before that the move of God will happen. It will start in January of 2020. So for three years, I announced it. It's already started, but it will take three years for people to realize they need to get in. Because that's what we do. God's got to pick us up, levitate us to show us that there's a move. Gold dust everywhere, gems, and then we're in. But what about the first person who doesn't have gold dust or gems or is not levitating or whatever? You know, I'm just making this stuff up. What if your filling is not gold? What if you still have your old one? <laughs> what if you're hurting? What if, what, if, what if the move of God starts and you're in a stretcher? You see... The first person that's in got healed when the water was stirred. Everybody's waiting for someone else to initiate. But see, a true leader is one that knows the opportunity is there. David viewed his visit to give his brothers happy meals at the war line there. His father sent him to give him happy meals to his brothers, right? David went with those meals. And all of a sudden, David discerned that his platform set up. It's time for his promotion. He went around like, why are you guys in your tents? Who, who's going who's gonna to confront this uncircumcised Philistine? You don't catch that, but when he said this uncircumcised Philistine, what he was saying was this, this, this person who's not in covenant with God. See, he realized the covenant. So he went at him knowing that this was his day. He had already been anointed by Samuel. This was the day that he moved into it. That's a true leader. Discerning your day, your opportunity. But see, David was patiently waiting. Did you know he waited 17 years? From most scholars say 17 years from when he was anointed. And he ended up in a cave called Adullam. Now, Adullam means justice of God or justice for the people. And all that were broke, disgusted, discouraged, gathered there to support him and became his fighting men, 400 of them. The qualification was 
broke, in debt, discouraged, disgusted, busted, whatever, you know. And you look up those words, and it's like, well, that's pretty much everybody. So you qualify. But those men, he trained 30 men to hit within a hair's breadth their target with a sling, which shows you that that rock wasn't a guided missile. David was practicing all the time. If he wasn't throwing rocks at trees with that sling, he was playing a harp. He was getting ready to drive out devils with his harp. And to kill giants. He had been anointed, but hadn't been set in. But yet he picked a target, and he practiced, and he practiced. And so then when his time came, right in the middle, the forehead. And then he trained others to do the same thing. This is what you're going to do. So you got to discern that... There's a time where God is going to place you in a situation, and it's your time to be the leader. David could not find one person, including the king, that would go out there and confront him. And they were bribing him with a wife and all this money and part of the kingdom. And, and, and you know, the, the, the armor wouldn't work. That's not how God trained him. He didn't fit into the mode, the mold. He didn't fit. He went out there with, with the, the giant said sticks and stones. You come at me with sticks? I want to show you what's in a leader. Someone who puts their foot down and will not give up, and that was David. Now listen to this. I think it's interesting. I found the other four giants in the Bible. David didn't plan on missing that day when he got five stones. He planned on all the relatives coming when they heard that he took out Goliath. He planned on taking out the whole family. Because he didn't miss. And God wants to train you not to miss. No, we all miss it. But a lot of it's not your fault. You're in a war. And a lot of you are judging yourself by your past. But God doesn't do that. Doesn't matter. What he's looking for is character. What he's looking for is faith. What he's looking for is someone that doesn't give up. I laugh. I laugh when things don't work out. Because I know that it's just notched, up, notched it up. I know in Vegas, if they understood this, they'd be putting bets down right now. Because it is a setup. Did you understand what I just said? If it goes wrong, if people really understood what God was doing, you'd double down. It's a holy place right now. Amen. You know, even a verbal with the Lord right now would help. Even a verbal just saying, you know what? I'm going on. I'm going on. And let me tell you something. You know how, like, uh, just like with Elijah... There were prophets that would say, hey, don't you know, you're, you told Elisha, don't you know your master's going to leave? Then after he left, he went, well, let's go find him. Remember all this? It's like, no. Elisha wasn't moved by any of that. It's just like the woman that was, that 
Elijah prophesied, you know, you're going to have a son. Then he dies. She wouldn't even tell him, how's your son? She made it impossible. She got her son back. But she didn't run up and say, you know, you told me. And he's dead. So you can sense in the spirit something. And it's just facts. But it's not the truth. Elisha only focused on what he was told. David only focused on what he was told by Samuel. Elisha focused on what he was told by Elijah. But things will work contrary. And you have to know what your track is. And you have to put your foot down. So to me, prayer... I'm just being honest with you. I don't pray anything unless I know I have it. I, I never pray asking for something. I don't pray that way. I walk with God and I demand his perfect will to be done. I yank his will into this realm. I do. Not being, Kathy knows this. When, when someone dies, I pray in tongues. I don't, I'm not going there. Somebody has a devil problem, I pray in tongues. I don't say anything right away because I got to find out if that person opened that door to that devil because that thing is bringing seven back. So I, it'll, go, it'll go and then you got seven more. And then they got, they got a whole house full. It's a lot of mouths to feed. You got all these invisible friends, you know, and, you know, so I want to get to the root of things. So I, with God's will, that's the root of everything. So why? Like, like, like I demand you to have a new building. I demand it. I'm not asking for it. You're, you're going to have a new building. That's the way it's going to be. I don't have anything else in my spirit. I'm not going to build something with duct tape. And cardboard? No, I want a brand new. I'm not going to fix something. God's resolution is not duct tape. Rick and Mitzi, they want a building. They're going to, I don't ask for it. I've never prayed that they would have a building. I command it to come forth. Like you two, I, I don't even, I mean, I, I never think that I'm going to pray for you all since I've met you. I just met you. But I never pray for you. I demand what it is that God has for you to come to you because you, you're a magnet. Yeah. They're a magnet for God. I'm not, not even really, like, really, I formally met them, hi, goodbye, not really talked to them yet, but I'm going to. But see, I know I can feel it. My giver button starts going off every time I get around them. That's why I know that they're a magnet for God. It's the same with, with your pastor and his wife. They're, 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 there's the magnet there. It's a, they're God magnets. Amen. I don't know what else to say to you all. But the, the blessings have to come because they're doing what they're supposed to do. Amen. And I can, I, I mean, I'm telling you, everyone in here, I don't see anybody that's repelling God. But I'm telling you, it's impossible for your husband not to come to you. It's impossible for him not because you're a God magnet. You're irresistible. I can't believe I'm sharing all these secrets. I never do this. But I allow God to make me irresistible to him. He grooms me to be that way. Is there anybody listening at all? Is there anybody that gets this? 
I, I tell the Holy Spirit, I'm not praying today, you are. I said, I want you to groom me to be irresistible. Make me a bride that is irresistible to Jesus. Make the body of Christ irresistible so you, we can get out of here. And he said, okay, well, you're fivefold, so get, get started. So now I got to convince the fivefold that they're not supposed to be turned outward, speaking against nations, but they're supposed to be talking and building the body up. Yeah. Well, I can't believe I just said that. Oh, I got duck because the stones are going to come. Okay, so this is what happens. We were in Seattle, Washington, and my pastor came up, and he prophesied. He says, I keep seeing this black Mercedes in your driveway. I'm like, I don't even want a black Mercedes. It sure didn't have BMW on it. <laughs> no, you know, no. No, it costs $800 to change oil. I'd rather have a jet. It's even cheaper. <laughs> it's cheaper to change the oil in a jet. <laughs> he goes, well, I just see it. He goes, I get this word. Everybody I've got this word for gets a Mercedes. I'm like, dude, okay. All right. So Kathy's like, oh, we'll accept it. All right, so we, the, right after that, the Lord tells us, you sell this house and, you, and, and you, you move to New Orleans. So we sold that house in Seattle. Then we, he said, sell your Phoenix house. I go, these are our retirement homes. So we sold them both. We moved to New Orleans. So in 2013, we moved into our house in New Orleans. And this guy, Jesse DePlanis, kept calling us and wanting to go to lunch. I'm like, I can't even understand this. So he pulls up in this black Mercedes. And I look through and I go, honey, he's, they're here. And the Lord says to me, He said, what is greater, the black Mercedes in your driveway or who's in it? And I realized that the prophecy had come to pass, but greater, greater is he who is in the Mercedes. <laughs> See, I got, do you get it? So sometimes when prophets see things, it's not the whole thing. He, that prophet saw a black Mercedes in my driveway. Do you get it? I'm trying to help you here. Your faith will take you beyond what you understand. But it's not a mental thing. So I want to announce to you and to the world that the Lord is making you irresistible. Yes. And you are attractive to him because you're being groomed by him. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is dwelling in you. And he's also praying through you. And we live and we move and we have our being in him. Hallelujah. Is it still today or is it tomorrow? Okay. <laughs> you know what's so funny? When the Spirit comes on you, it's almost like He takes you over the wall that you, it's all your limitations. And then the Spirit comes on you and you get a peek over the wall at your future. It's an amazing thing. It's like you operate in that, in that prophetic and you're speaking by the Spirit. And then all of a sudden, you get to peek yourself. Yes. Under that anointing, you can see ahead. And it's amazing to me, in a flash right now, in a flash right now, this couple here, 
I saw 117 songs that are on the shelf of heaven that need to be brought forth. They're, the, that's what I saw. But I never say this kind of stuff. I'll wait years and, and I'll keep checking on Amazon. I won't say nothing because it's conditional. But they're there. I saw this when I was having. I saw all these things that are supposed to happen, and some of them have never happened because it's conditional. In other words, you have to be interactive with God in the spirit. So, like, you could just stay here forever, and you'll just... Or God could move you on with what he has, and, it, and you expand out. And sometimes you don't fill the building until you get the building. It's the same way with your job. You know, the Lord told me, like Rodney Howard Brown came to our church in, in Scottsdale way back. We had just, the church, we had just bought this building. Um, and, the, and the pastor had a, a person who was financing it. And it was an old, it's a, it, not old, but it was a very, very expensive stable. You know, it's better than a Walmart now. I mean, but this, it's like high-end better than anything you've ever seen. These horses live better than most people do. But it was for sale, and but they, the sliding doors were off where the stables were and everything. So we're in there, and Rodney comes. And he's, like, talking, and he's looking, and, I mean, it's 110 degrees out, and there's, like, these big gaping doors where there were sliding doors for the... And there this, so we're in this, this big sanctuary with stables all around. And uh, he goes, yeah, we believe in the open door policy here. <laughs> he goes, if you don't like it here, just go out and hug a cactus. And people just start falling out. And about a week later, we all wake up for a whole week. You, I can't tell you, I cannot tell you what happened in between. I just remember people being pinned under large ushers that were trying to pull people off, and they fell. And so people were crawling, trying to get out from under big people as they were stacked. And Rodney's like, uh, be careful with the bodies. They're not sacks of potatoes. You know. Move the bodies off to the side. See what I mean? And the same anointing just comes right through me when I talk about it. Okay, so he's there. It was open heaven. I have never been the same since then, but I've never met him. Everybody that was in that meeting has never been the same. But that happened years ago. Years ago. I feel like Kenneth Hagin is right here with me. I feel like Benny Hinn is right here with me. Jesse's right here with me. It's, just, it's, just, it's the most amazing thing. Every person that's laid hands on me is right here with me. It's the strangest thing. And what it does is it causes you to be able to see further. And I realized when I was in heaven, there was all these books, all these things that, I mean, my books, that's how I know how many books I will write because they were on a shelf in heaven. And the angels that came to me, they handed them through this veil. And they said, this is from the Lord God. And so you're not to go with that publisher and with that movie company to do your story. Because these are from the Lord God, and no man shall touch them. And they handed it through the veil. And I said, well, what do I do? Because there's this veil. And it was covering my book. And it was all ornamented with gems, which, you know, it's too expensive down here to do that. So you'll have to do with the paperback. But... <laughs> They were on the shelf of heaven. They were sacred. And the angels, there was like, a, there were six of them. And the one in the middle is going like this. I go, well, I'm thinking, I can't pick it. I can't take it because it's, he goes, just reach out. And when I did, the, it slipped through the veil and I took it. Well, I hadn't written it yet. 
Well, I hadn't finished it. So it was strange because we had to tell, we had to turn down millions of dollars by going with Sony and Simon and & Schuster and making a movie and all this stuff because the Lord told me to do it this way. But I wouldn't be standing here if I had done it the other way. So the Lord wants me to ask you something. What is on the other side of the wall? Would you like to know? The Lord's asking me to ask you, do you want to know what's on the other side of the wall? Well, what you have to do is you have to see yourself on the other side of the wall already. Because that limitation can't stay there forever. Because in your spirit, the spirit wants to take you over it, through it, whatever it takes. And the limitations that are stopping you are only in your mind. Listen, all of us in here, we're all going to be in heaven someday. I kid you not. It's no different than us going from this room to another room and sitting down and eating. There is no difference. This life to that life is though you walk through a hallway and there's a table set for you with your name on it. There's no difference, nothing even different than what I just said. So we're all here like that. We will be over there seated in, in designated seats that go forever. The table goes forever. It's not very wide, but it's very long. And we sit face to face. No one cares if they're sitting by Jesus or not because you all are going to get your visit with him. So it doesn't matter. Like down here, they're fighting over who's going to sit on each side of him. I really don't care. I would rather someone else do it. I just thank God that I'm there. Okay, that's the way it is. Okay, so if we're all going to be there, we're all going to high-five it and say we made it, then why can't we do something right now in this room while we're here? Why can't we just be extreme in our faith, extreme in our vision? Allow God to give us dreams again. You know, and the whole thing about the claws last night that I, I bought those, I wanted to give them to the children. I wanted them under their pillows so that they would dream. Because I want that generation. Satan is trying to steal out of the womb. He's trying to steal by keeping kids out of school. So... The Lord, I said, Lord, what are we going to do about this? He says, you're going to start a home school. And you're going to give kids money. You're going to buy them instruments. You're going to do every, you're going to start kids shows. You're going to do, this is what you're going to do. You're going to take back that generation. See, Satan's plan is to, to completely eliminate a handoff. I'm, I kid you not. You don't see this. Just like you don't see the trickle down effect of our economy because it hasn't hit yet. But you watch what happens. It's, uh, there's a delay. You don't, you don't see it, but Satan's intent was that when I turn around to hand the baton off to the next person, there's nobody there. That was his intent, is that I would have no generation to hand this off to. So think about it. All the generals, they sit and they talk. They say, I have no one to hand this off to. I'm like, I'll take it. I'll do it. And I'll train a whole bunch of people to take it too. But see, we, we, we forgot that God is into families and generations. And so we don't, we, don't, we don't prepare people under us to hand things off anymore. But yet, you know, and I know the curse of the third, of the third generation. Now listen to me very carefully, and I promise I'll close. The curse is this. Abraham... God appears to him, makes a covenant with him. He is a Kuwaiti. He lives in southern Iraq. God says, now you're a Jew. Just a moment ago, he's a, he's a, mo a moon worshiper in Ur of the Chaldees, an Iraqi. Now he says, no, I'm making a nation out of you. 
takes him to Canaan, stops in Bethel, tells him to build an altar there. He builds an altar there. Several times when he passes through, he stops there. It's a memorial. It's an honor. Isaac passes through. The same king, the same king that stole Abraham's wife, stole Isaac's wife. Check it out in the Bible. It's the same name. Okay, so now we got, so we got Abraham, we got Isaac, we got Bethel, okay, Jacob. Jacob is running. A lot of family problems. Laban changes his wages 10 different times. Jacob's blessed. Everybody's mad. So Jacob gets tired one night. He lays down, doesn't have a pillow, so he takes a rock. He's in Bethel, but doesn't know the heritage. Think about what I'm saying here. This is what Satan's design is for this generation, not to remember the heritage we have, not to be able to hand off to the next generation. You know? So he has a a dream, a vision of a ladder. And the angels are going up and down. Well, no kidding. The portal was opened up by Abraham. Isaac visited it. Jacob didn't know his heritage. Why do I know that? Because when he woke up, he said, I did not know that the Lord was in this place. Well, he should have. That's a direct quote from Jesus to me. He should have. He should have known that the Lord was in his place. And I'm convinced that that stone was part of the altar. That that stone, when he put that on his head, that was part of the altar. And it opened up a blind man's eyes to the spirit realm. But that generation should not have been blind. The Lord wants you to see over that wall. That wall's of flesh. It's a veil. I'm going to do something that I shouldn't do, but the Lord is telling me to do it. I saw this three days ago that I would say this, and I said, no, I'm not. Our house got paid off. Then someone left us millions. Okay? We didn't tell our church, you know, because then millions turns into change. <laughs> so we didn't, we didn't buy a new car. We, we, built, we, we drove the same car. Kitty car, I called it. We went to church. We started praying and started taking portions of it and giving it away secretly. We walked in late to church one morning, and this, who was that guy? Because he was, he was trained under Kim Clement. Rutkins. Yeah, Prophet Rutkins. He was speaking that day. So I come in. We sit down. It's already started. He goes, you, sir, don't sit down. He said, get up here. Is that your wife? I go, well, you're the prophet. You tell me. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. We went up there. He said, thus saith the Lord. Now, this is what he said. Nobody knows. Nobody. Not the pastor, nobody. Especially not the pastor. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, know what? you know what I mean? It's like all of a sudden everybody's your friend, you know. This man says, I've never met this man. He says, thus saith the Lord, the next million that's coming. The next million? Everybody turns around and goes, they don't even have a million. <laughs> no, did you, did you catch what? Are you feeling the faith rise up? I'm not, I'm not making this. Am I making this up, Kathy? Hairdresser and flight attendant. 
That's all we were. No pulpit, no 501, nothing. Zero and not known, no invitations, no one cares. Been to heaven, no one knew about it because I wasn't allowed to talk about it. I went 13 years without saying anything about it because it was forbidden. Every time I would go to say it, the Spirit would say, So this is what happens. I can't explain the first million, but now I'm wanting to know about the next million. But I had nothing to do with any of it, and we have, there's no way that we can do what we did. We're just, we're just blue-collar workers, <laughs> servants. Work for free in our church when other people were getting paid. For years, working full-time and then spending more time than the pastor was at the church and not getting paid, not even a free meal. Didn't care. We, we were sewing. So the Lord at Rodney's in that building had said, double tithe. Like, what does that mean? He said, you tithe off of what you want to make. Well, we were making 3000 a month before all this happened. And I needed 6000 So we tithe $600 a month. And we did that for three years. You know what happened? Nothing. Zero. We actually did without in order to give that 600 a month. I'm, 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 I'm telling you the truth, right? We, we were tithing off of what we wanted to make. It was impossible. I was working full time, working extra, making 11 bucks an hour as a flight attendant. She was a hairdresser. And uh, they told me when I signed the contract with Southwest Airlines, you will never make more than $25 an hour. Ever. So I thought, well, at least double what I'm making would be good. I said, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't know, but I know. So I'm just going to do it. So we did it. At the end of the three years, when nothing had happened, we kept doing it. And I get a call. You are not to report for work tomorrow. But my union called and said, you're not going to work tomorrow. You're going on strike. 1201 tonight, you're going on strike. Do not report to your airplane. I'm like, you, your mama. <laughs> I said, no. The Lord is going to rebuke the devourer for my sake. The Lord is going to rebuke the devourer for my sake. The windows of heaven are open. You know, Malachi 310. Okay, at 11.59, Colleen Barrett, vice president of Southwest Airlines, tells Herb Kelleher, we're going to settle with those flight attendants because they spend 85% of the time with the passenger. We take care of them. 110% raise. So it went... From three thousand a month to six thousand and two hundred dollars or something a month. <laughs> but you know that tithing's Old Testament, you know. <laughs> it's so interesting to me. You see, the Lord will have you go over the wall and build something there. Let's do that in prayer right now. Father, you framed the worlds by your words, and you taught us to speak to mountains. And they would be removed. Father, I want to build, I want to build up the body. I want to see the body prosper. I want to see people stand in their authority and in their destiny. And Father, we live in an economic world. 
And we need the wealth that has been designated for your work to come. And I command it to come in Jesus' name. Every, every asset that is designed and destined for God's work, I command it to come to the righteous right now. In Jesus' name. And I frame the new building. I frame the expansion. I call the things that are not as though they were because I'm an imitator of my father. Ha, ha, ha. I'm an imitator of God as dearly loved. And I frame my world by my words. We're not shrinking. We're expanding. There's a world that needs to come to Jesus. And we're in an economic world, so the wealth must come. Come to your destination, to your assignment, in the name of Jesus. I command every foul and lying devil that is stopping your dream. I command those evil spirits to leave you now. In Jesus' name, all over the world, you should have called your friends by now and tell them. This will multiply. All over the world, this message shall go. That it's time for the body of Christ to prepare for the wedding feast. And before that happens, Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the gospel must be preached to all the world. And then the end shall come. So put your end time DVDs away. And right now, dream in the name of Jesus. Have visions in the name of Jesus. Open up the heavens above through your heartfelt proclamation of your faith to the Lord. I'm believing for one billion souls. The wealth of the wicked is mine. And those souls... The Lord said, ask of me and I'll give you the nations. Well, I'm asking. Nations, plural. Not just one. Not just America. I want continents. Ha, ha, ha. Everybody's standing here. Come on. As you stand, you're going you're gonna to stand up in the glory cloud. And I want you to receive the impartation of the things that are not, that really are. They're going to come upon you. It starts in the spirit. It starts in the spirit. You receive in your spirit. And then it is manifest through your tongue. It's an exchange. There's a transaction happening. I can hardly talk. There's a transaction right now because you can feel the heaviness, the weightiness. Oh, all over the world, reach out and, and grab this. There's a weightiness of heaven. It's because the glory wants to come through you and out of you into this realm. The Lord is imparting your future into you right now it's pages it's terabytes of information that will take years to manifest oh they say oh kevin it's only going to be days and jesus is coming no it ain't coming until the harvest comes in i want one billion souls at least there's almost eight billion souls on the earth right now i'll just ask for the whole earth what's What's more impossible? Give strength to everyone's body right now, and I command sickness to leave and disease. I, I want creative miracles. Supernatural finances. In the name of Jesus. Oh, can you, can you guys play? Are you, is that all right? Oh, man. Just let the... I'm serious. This is not superstitious. 
There is an impartation coming from heaven right now. It's going to change you forever. God's doing his work. The Spirit of God just said to me, nothing is impossible in this environment. Nothing. Nothing. Receive your husband right now. Receive your wife right now. Just receive. Receive your provision right now. Receive your debt-free status. Receive your healing right now. See yourself walking. See yourself whole. See yourself well. Sickness shall depart. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Say this with me. The Lord is good. And His mercy endures forever. This is what was said when the glory cloud came in to the temple. The Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. The Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. That means right now, a thousand years from now. What's the difference? Hallelujah. there's anyone who is watching or in this room who's not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, just repeat after me. Jesus, why don't you guys all just pray with me in case there's someone watching online maybe that, and this, this, remember this will be seen for years, so it's about the harvest. Um, Jesus, I thank you for dying for me. I, confess and repent of all my sins and I ask you to come into my life come into my heart heal me make me whole I want to be born again I receive eternal life now I thank you Father enable me to walk in the book that you have ordained for me from the foundations of the world. And I ask you now to baptize me with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I receive you, Holy Spirit, and I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire into me now. And I receive my prayer language. And I pray in other tongues. So let's all... um, As we begin to worship, let's pray in the spirit a little bit. Help those people online. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling your people. Filling your people now. Holy Spirit and fire, fill your people now. All around the world, fill your people now. Holy Spirit. Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit of the Living God, Holy, Holy Spirit of the Living God, who was and is and is to come. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, that you're coming again. so good, he's so good, and he 
His mercy endures forever. Your mercy endures forever. And His mercy endures forever. Yes, His mercy endures forever. Oh, His mercy endures forever. God, Your mercy endures forever. Yes, Your mercy endures forever. Your mercy endures forever. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you always come when we ask you. You're always open and willing to do even more. Because his mercy endures forever. Yes, his mercy endures forever. Oh, his mercy endures forever. We give thanks, cause your mercy endures forever. Yes, your mercy endures forever. Oh, your mercy endures forever. We give thanks. Oh, your mercy endures forever. Yes, your mercy endures forever. Oh, your mercy endures forever. So we give thanks. Yes, we give thanks. Oh, we give thanks. We give thanks. We give thanks. Oh, we give thanks. And we give thanks for your mercy endures forever. It can be no other way. It can be no other way. It can be no other way. It can be no other way way than this right here. Your presence is forever. Oh, your presence is forever. Never changing, never changing. Your presence is forever. And you'll never fall off your throne. You'll never fall off your throne. You can never fall off your throne. You reign forever and ever. You will never fall off your throne. You will never fall off your throne. You will never fall off your throne. You reign forever. You reign forever. You will never fall off your throne. You reign forever. Oh, you reign forever. You reign forever. So we give praise for his mercy endures forever. Yes, his mercy endures forever. Oh, his mercy endures forever. We give praise. Cause your mercy endures forever. Yes, your mercy endures forever. Oh, your mercy endures forever. So we give thanks. And we give praise. Yes, we give thanks. We give praise and we give thanks and we give praise. Yes, 
stop dreaming and believing that all things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. You know, as Brother Kevin was finishing up and he was sharing and I couldn't stand anymore. And I got on my face and the Lord said, don't you ever again limit me to what I told you I would do. Don't you ever again limit me to what I told you I will do. And then he said, you and Susan, you keep teaching the people to stop limiting me says if you have to drag them you drag them if you got to push them you push them he says but get them out the doors get them out the doors and we have told you all this from the beginning this is not a place you come to sit and get comfortable this is not a place you're gonna come and put your name behind one of these seats the moment you do that I'm gonna yank the seat from under you this is your gym you come, you flex your muscles, you build your muscles here, and there's the door. You go out there, and you go and do what God has called you to do. You don't have a formal membership here. There is no such thing in this place. You have a membership in the body of Christ, and you are called to go preach the gospel. Our responsibility is to come underneath you and lift you up take you to that place that God has for you. Amen? That's our role is to come and lift you up and support you. And when God speaks to you and God gives you that word, you come and you tell us what God is saying. And we will be the first ones to be your cheerleaders to say, go. Go do. Go do. Amen? And so for Susan and I, now you guys, and Susan, I have to say this, but you guys have no idea how this got started with us. We were listening to Jesse Duplantis last year in July. Well, I got stereo. And in July, and we're sitting at home, and all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord told us, get in your vehicle and go to the vision conference. We called the leaders. We said, here's the keys. We're leaving. They were like, where are you going? We're going to New Orleans. They went, what? We said, yeah, we jumped in our vehicle, we drove. We said, Father, when we arrive in that city, from the moment we arrive in the city, we want to see, we want to see what you're going to do. We came off by the uh, Mercedes Stadium. We got off the ramp. As soon as we got off, the, I guess the ramps are so short there, exiting the ramp, there was a man standing a homeless man standing there. We came to the stoplight and the Lord said, so, I reached in my wallet and I grabbed some money. He came over to me and 
I'm handing the money to him. And as I'm handing it to him, he's speaking in gibberish. Not Cajun, gibberish. But the moment the money touched his hand, all of a sudden he started telling us his life story about his mother abandoning him and how his life has been so hard and how he's been homeless. And I'm, we're looking at the red light and I'm holding half the money and he's holding half and he's just telling his life story. And I let go. And he turned around, put his hands up and he started praising God, picked up his plastic bucket, walked in front of us and just walked. And we're still at the red light and he just walked off. And from the moment we hit that city, everywhere we went, the Lord said, so, so, so. We walked into the conference and we're sitting in the back. And this is the first time we ever saw Jesse. Well, we've seen him quite a few times in Maui. He's come to our, we used to be at, um, with Dr. Uh, Morocco's church. So, we, you know, everyone came through, we saw. But he started prophesying and walking around the sanctuary. And we went, wow. And then he started speaking about the harvest and about a grocery store and about feeding the people spiritually and physically. And Susan and I are sitting there and we start weeping. And we went, he's speaking about what we're doing. Two weeks after we came back, Andrew and Grace walked into this church, never seen them before. They sat in the last row. And the moment that they came into this building, we watched them. They raised their hands, closed their eyes, and started worshiping. They never looked around. And then Terry and Sandy came. And then Chris and Michelle came. And then all of a sudden, over the last six months, people are popping up. And we went, God, you're up to something. Because our prayer has always been, Lord, only reveal us to those you want us revealed to and hide us from those you want us hidden from. Because we don't pursue people. We pursue God. Amen. And so we are so honored to have you all in, in our home. And it's a blessing. Amen. And what you did when you placed that tallit on my neck, I'm not sure if you noticed what's sitting on that cross. That tallit was my original tallit that was given to me from Jerusalem. And when we started the church, the Lord told me to put it there. He said, that's the finished work of the cross, Old and New Testament, complete. And it sits on the, on, there on the cross, amen. Oh. And we are so believing for that new building. God told us that that grocery store is going to be a hub and there's going to be 12 spokes in this city and we're going to help the spokes grow and it's going to feed thousands and thousands of people. Amen? Let me stop because I will go on and on. But Father, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the freedom of the Holy Spirit in this place. We thank you, Lord, that not one word would go, would go void in our lives. Not one, but everything that was spoken would resonate in our spirit. And Lord, because of technology, we can go back and we can see it again and listen to it again and nourish ourselves again in the word. And Father, let not one person in this place remain the same when they leave these doors. Let the, us, each one of us, be continually be transformed by the hearing of the word and the doing of the word. And we bless you, Father. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for the light. We thank you for the heavy rain. We thank you that the rain has stopped and is over because now we're finished. And so, Father, we just give you honor and glory for everything that is said and done in this place today. In Jesus' name, we all say in agreement. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a blessed day, God. Study night, 7.30, study.